Good afternoon, Mr. Campbell. Let me just briefly introduce you to our audience so they get a, an idea of, uh, of you and uh, your previous work and accomplishments. Um, you're the author of the trilogy My Big TOE, which stands for Theory of Everything. And I quote, it seeks to unify, now to quote, science and philosophy, physics and metaphysics, mind and matter, purpose and meaning, the normal and the paranormal, as well as shines a light on the common spiritual basis of the world's major religions, while placing beliefs, dogma, and creed into a bigger picture. Preceding your authorship of these books, you had a professional career as a large systems analyst and physicist with NASA for more than 30 years. Sometime into your career, you joined Mr. Bob Monroe's team of volunteering participants and research team members. The experiments include practices including volitional out-of-body experiences, remote viewing scenarios, telepathy and other paranormal phenomena at the time. Um, in the proverbial nutshell, if you had to put your big theory into it, what does it say? Well, it's hard to put a theory of absolutely everything in a nutshell. They don't, <laughs> they, it doesn't fit in nutshells very easily. Even yes. the largest of nutshells, even a coconut shell would be would yeah. be very difficult. But if I just had to say just a few words uh, to summarize it, let's put it in maybe 25 words or less, something like that. Um, I would first say that it is science and it is logical. Mm -hmm. It has no uh, strange assumptions. It has only two assumptions. And one is that consciousness exists. And another is, is that uh, evolution exists. And from that point on, it's just logical. So, you know, where does this logically lead? And how does consciousness evolve? And where does it go? Uh, you know, starting with the most, um, what, uh, simple piece of consciousness you can start with, and then we let it evolve. So it starts that way. And eventually, we see that consciousness is an information system. Consciousness is about information. Perception is gathering information. Awareness is aware of what? Well, you describe that what with information. So consciousness is information. And I posit uh, the consciousness as just an entire system, okay, as what I call the larger consciousness system. And I show in my model, I go through a couple of logical steps, which eventually comes to the conclusion that consciousness is fundamental, more fundamental than the physical reality. That is logically derived from the fact that in my experiments within the non-physical, I found that I can make changes in the non, I can do things in the non-physical that make changes in the physical but I can't do the reverse. I can't make changes in the physical that make some kind of substantive change in consciousness. So from the larger consciousness system, you can modify physical things, but it doesn't go the other way. So logic tells you that the consciousness is the superset. You know, the, the, the causal logic flows from consciousness to the physical reality. So consciousness is a, is a superset and this physical reality is a subset of that larger consciousness system actually it's a simulation created by that larger consciousness system um well you the, the readers may not understand this but it's a simulation that's basically an entropy reduction drainer you know it's a virtual reality just like we have uh, flight trainers for pilots you know this is an entropy reduction trainer for individuated units of consciousness. Maybe I can help out here. Entropy is like um, devolving from uh, order to disorder. Can we put it like that maybe? Yes, um, entropy is a measure of disorder. So high entropy is high disorder. Yes. So you have an information system that's nothing but random bits, then that system is at its maximum entropy. And as you get some of those bits and and uh, order them, that creates information. 
that ordered bit could be a letter of the alphabet or a number or something that has intrinsic meaning and significance, which then creates information. So uh, in any case, uh, more logic derives the fact that uh, consciousness, individual agents of consciousness, like us, that's what we are, that our purpose here now, I've skipped about four or five steps in this because I'm trying to squeeze it all into this proverbial nutshell. So I've skipped a lot of the logical steps here, but it turns out that consciousness is evolving. Okay? The consciousness system is evolving. It's a real system. It's not infinite. It's not perfect. It's a real system. It's an ongoing process. Um, and it's not perfect. But in any case, it does serve that same sort of function as the source. So this larger consciousness system is the source. And the way consciousness evolves is to lower its entropy, create information, because it's an information system. And individuated units of consciousness like us, we form a social system. And the way a social system optimizes itself, of course, is by lowering its entropy, but it does that by cooperating, by caring, by, by giving, you know, it's a, and I just sum all that cooperation, caring, giving, you know, em empathy, um, there's a whole lot of those kinds of, you know, huggy feely words that go up there, but I call them all just love. Cool. So it turns out that we as individuated units of consciousness are uh, here in this virtual reality that consciousness has also evolved, didn't program, but evolved it. Um, you know, initial set initial conditions with a, with a rule set. And you punch the run button and let the mm -hmm. initial conditions change according to the rule set. And that's a simulation. And it evolves and it evolves into our physical reality, our physical universe. And that is there to give us individual units of consciousness choices that have um, important, you know, moral uh, overtones, choices that have consequences, choices that really matter. Uh, as opposed to consciousness just being in a big chat room where they're all chatting with each other, but there's very few consequences that have, you know, any significance. The consequences are all very minor. Therefore, the evolution is very minor. So the system needed to make this virtual reality to give consciousness an environment in which they were more severely challenged, more severely tested and by the choices that consciousness makes, that's how, it, that's how it evolves. If those choices are choices in the service of love or cooperative choices, caring choices, choices about other, then that is lowering its entropy, which is positive evolution. If the choices are self-serving and you know, egotistical and belief-based, then that puts them on the opposite side of love, which is fear, and that's de-evolution. So consciousness makes choices. This virtual reality gives us a wonderful set of choices in this multiplayer game we call physical reality. So now that kind of gives you a very, in a nutshell, sketch of the model. So it's about virtual reality, but virtual reality where consciousness is the computer. There's lots of different virtual reality concepts out there, but this one is unique in that consciousness is the computer. I understand. Um, I was going to say that um, ideas and theories of uh, this reality being a, a simulation actually has gained some traction over the last mm -hmm. decades. Uh, you say that your theory is uh, insofar different as it posits consciousness first and fundamental mm -hmm. as the, the system and its cause at the same time, if I understood you correctly. Like it's, uh, it's the cause and effect at the same time in the beginning. And once it starts, once someone presses the enter button or the run button, evolution takes place and consciousness evolves. And uh, 
you know, becomes more sophisticated and more aware pro probably of itself and, and all these things that we attribute to evolution, at least where, they, where it pertains to human beings. Are you okay with that summarization? Yeah, yeah, pretty well, except I wouldn't say that when the run button is hit, that's not necessarily when consciousness begins to evolve. Consciousness mm -hmm. is a, an assumption going in that consciousness exists. But I start with it in its primordial or its most basic form. Consciousness I define as awareness with a choice. You know, it's awareness that makes choices. It's just that okay. simple. Mm -hmm. So it's aware. That means it has perception. It's aware of things. Mm -hmm. you know, that, and it's aware of, its, of itself. I guess it's the first thing that you're aware of is, is the, you know, the Descartes moment, you know. I think, therefore, I am. So you're aware of yourself, and then it makes it can make choices, and choices require time before choice, after choice. So if you have determinism, you have no time and no choices. Everything is just predetermined. If you have consciousness, then you have choices, and you have time. And you have one other thing, and that's free will, because without free will, there also are no choices. Okay. The word choice doesn't define anything if you have a deterministic reality, because there are no choices. Everything is already determined. So to have uh, an awareness with choice requires free will and time and consciousness. That's the, those three go together. Now, on the opposite end of that, that's directly and logically opposed, the opposite of that, just, uh, you might say, is materialism. And if you are a materialist, then you must also be a determinist. Materialism and determinism uh, have to go together, just like the time and, and you know, the consciousness and free will have to go together. They have to go together in a sense that you couldn't have any of them if you didn't have the others. You know, it takes all three of those together to make a real thing. And with the, with the uh, materialism, it's the same way. It's impossible to be a materialist and not be a, a determinist and still be logical. Because yeah. materialism is actually Newton's viewpoint of the clockwork universe. The universe is just a big machine. And when you have a big machine, then everything works according to the rules, period. You know, there is no choice. The machine can't say, well, I'll turn over this crank and I'll move this gear. You know, it mm. cranks turn and gears move and things happen as they have to happen in a machine. So mm. that's why determinism has to follow uh, materialism. But it's interesting. The results from quantum physics experiments were so shocking and were so radically different from everything we had known until then that uh, it forced physics at large to, uh, to adopt a new perspective However, some people, some scientists still refuse or reject that and say it's still all deterministic. And you seem to say that um, this view is entirely wrong or at least incomplete. But what do you say to them? Um, I say it's wrong. Okay. Um, what quantum mechanics did uh, initially, I think the double slit experiment was actually the beginning of quantum mechanics. The double slit experiment shows that reality is not materialistic. Information is a very important part about the outcome of that experiment. If you don't know what slit the particle goes through, then you get an interference pattern. If you do know what slit it goes through, then you get a particle pattern, just two lumps behind each slit. So knowing information, that's information, what, what is known about it is important. It changes the outcome of the experiment. And the only way to mathematically model quantum physics is probabilistically. You have to say particles don't, exa don't exist. Mass doesn't really exist. It's all just probability. And... In the vernacular of quantum physics, when you make the measurement, that is, when you, when you collect the information, then the wave form collapses to a particle. Then you get a little chunk of mass. But the particle fundamentally is just probability. You see, so quantum physics, and that was the very early 
first quarter of the of the 1900s, you know, the 20th century. So that's about 100 years old now. Mm-hmm. And that was a real big bomb going off in the world of physics because this said that materialism fundamentally was wrong. The problem was that the physicists could not come up with any other explanation. They couldn't say, well, okay, well, here's, here's why, you know, particles really should be probability distributions. They couldn't come up with that other theory that, you know, explained this. So after some, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 years of trying and coming up empty handed, they took a different approach. They said, well, we're just meant not to know this. This is one of those secrets of nature that we'll never know. And it can't be known. And we'll just call quantum mechanics weird science. It's just not like other sciences, which are fundamentally logical. This one is not. It's got this uh, non-intuitive, non-local thing about it that uh, we'll just never know. So that got them off the hook from trying to figure it out because they decided that it was impossible. And instead of coming up with solutions, they decided that it was just weird physics and would always be weird physics. So at that point, they went back to materialism uh, with this odd weird physics that just didn't kind of fit, but it was an outlier. You know, it was a kind of an outside case. So they kind of said, well, that's different. Yeah, so that was their thinking. And most scientists today, particularly the older group, are still, you know, caught in the Newtonian viewpoint of reality, which is the clockwork universe, you know, that materialism is, is how this universe works. Material things is, are fundamental. And it's a, it's a strange thing, you know, that physicists would stick to that because there's so many things in physics that are very basic things. You know, physics has just a few basic things and everything else in physics is how these basic things affect each other and how they change and how changing one affects the other. So the basic things are like time, mass, charge, spin, space, I don't know, maybe forgetting a couple of them, but those are the ones that come to mind. And gravity. Yeah, that would, gonna, yeah, gravity, yeah, yeah. that would be one gravity. So these are the basic things. And now everything else is kind of made up of these. But if you ask a physicist where any of these basic things come from, what is their causality? What causes time? What causes mass? What causes space? What causes charge? Where does that come from? They'll say, I don't know. It just is. Okay, so that is a real, um, you know, lack of logic there in their beginning, just to say, it just is, because it is, because we see it, and that's why it's there. So the very basic things of our world are things that are somewhat mystical, because they have no physical causality. They just are. Well, things with no physical causality is what we call paranormal. You know, if you don't have any physical causality, then it's not normal. It's paranormal. So at the very heart and root of physics, all of their basic assumptions are <laughs> paranormal. You see, they're, they're mystical. These things just come out of nowhere. So that tells you that the theory has problems. <laughs> you know, when you get that kind of a uh, you know, like quantum mechanics is just weird science. Well, that tells you the science is incomplete. So it's, it's just obviously incorrect because quantum physics is a logical science. And the fact that this is a paradox, you see, and quantum mechanics comes with a whole basket full of paradoxes. This is this one double slit. That's just one of them. But there's lots of other things that are... Schrodinger's cat, for example. Yeah, we have that. We have tunneling, you know, things. Superposition, all these yeah, things. All yeah, all this stuff are just... Yeah. There's a lot of paradoxes. So we know they're like that, and we know that the math works that way, mm-hmm. but uh, we don't know why they should be that way. Mm-hmm. Well, my, my thing, where I started was that I, was, I had two careers. You know, all the time some, from... Shortly after I took my first job out of graduate school, I met Bob Monroe and started working also studying consciousness. 
So okay. my, my career in physics and my career in consciousness both started about the same time. And my career in physics was a full-time job. My career in consciousness research was pretty close to a half-time job, you know, anywhere between 15 and 20 hours a week. You know, I was put into wow. that out at the lab with Bob Monroe. Mm -hmm. So I eventually had a set of facts in consciousness from my own experience, you know, with mm -hmm. consciousness and, and with uh, the out of body and the remote viewing and all these things, which are artifacts of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I had facts, things like I just mentioned that uh, the consciousness is fundamental and the physical mm -hmm. world isn't just because of how causality flows between the two. So I had these facts and I had a bunch of facts of physics because I was a physicist, you know, a bunch of about the physical reality. And I wanted a, an overall understanding that was simple and elegant with no unusual assumptions that answered all of the facts, my basket full of facts in consciousness, my basket full of facts in a physical world. So 35 years later of doing this research in consciousness, coming up with those facts, because they're a little harder to get than physical facts. You, you have to work at that a little bit. You have to repeat experiments over and over and over again and isolate variables and do all that sort of thing. So it took a long time to do these, these, uh, these consciousness facts. You know, it had to be repeatable. You had to uh, uh, know why things were the way they were and, and how they varied with other parameters. And so it took a long time. So it was about 35 years later, I thought I understood consciousness well enough that I could come up with a theory that explained both consciousness mm -hmm. and would derive physics. And it does. It derives quantum acquaintance quantum mechanics, um, you know, from the very uh, beginning, and it gets the right answers. And not only that, it solves all of those paradoxes. All those paradoxes then have a nice logical solution of why they are the way they are and why it really couldn't be any other way. So then I started looking for other uh, paradoxes, you know, paradoxes in uh, psychology and paradoxes in neuroscience and other kinds of paradoxes, paradoxes in biology, and found that all these paradoxes resolve themselves from this viewpoint of our reality is a computed reality, a virtual reality, our physical reality is, and consciousness is the source. Consciousness is a part of the consciousness system, which is an information system, configures itself as the server that serves up the virtual reality. And another part of it is you and I, individu individuated units of consciousness. So this, this source plays all the roles. And uh, then I started developing the logic of meeting all those things I, I learned in studying consciousness and in, in the out-of-body experiences and the remote viewing and those sorts of things. So that's where the model comes from. It's basically just uh, uh, trying to come up with something that fit everything, explained all the data that we have, and explains new stuff. You know, it explains a whole lot of, of uh, things that we don't know now. Like, where does space and time come from? Well, mm -hmm. you know, this theory explain, has, a, has a causal reason for those things. They're not, they, they don't just magically appear because they appear. Um, a lot of physicists have been trying as well to come up with answers because of all these paradox paradoxes and loose ends that mm -hmm. they are trying to, to tie up and you know fit into a bigger picture. One of the, to me, more interesting uh, concepts, um, apart from just saying it just is, which is a very unscientific way of going about things, you know, just accepting things for what they are and, and stopping to look. The more interesting things that I found. Um, the idea, the concept of uh, the implicate order by Prima uh, Bohm, you may be familiar with them, you know, mm -hmm. they are around the time that, that Einstein, you know, released his uh, general relativity theory or was already established and, and they were in his wake or even on his team for some time. But um, apparently in, in, in some aspects of the theory, they deviated and um, especially David Bohm um, reasoned that from what we see and from what our experiments tell us, the information that we get from that is there is some pattern, some larger information at play here, which he called the implicate order, that seems to inform all these processes and we get to measure 
and look at and record and whatnot. Do you like to comment on that? Well, Bomb, you're right. He does say there's this this thing behind the curtain, you know, that nice. that is, yeah, you know, nice. as a as a metaphor, you know, there is yeah, this thing yeah. behind the curtain that is yeah. important, that's fundamental, that's more fundamental than what's out here in front of the curtain. And I would agree with that assumption, and that's what my larger conscious system is. It's that thing behind the curtain. That's what consciousness is. Not just the larger conscious system, but consciousness is that thing behind the curtain. So uh, talking about the, the Big Bang and the fact that there is no logical reason why that ball of plasma you know, was sitting there under a very high temperature and high pressure, and then suddenly, bang, you know, and everything after that started to evolve and uh, evolved according to science, you know, to the rules, you know, gravity, explosions, pressure, pressure expands, you know, gravity pulls things together, you know, as it expands, it cools, as it cools, you know, it comes it into, it, it clumps and, yeah. you know, all of that sort of thing. Well, that's the rule set. Okay. Yeah. And that ball of plasma is the initial conditions. So when I say that consciousness made a virtual reality, they started with initial conditions, which was that ball of plasma high temperatures, whatever, and a rule set that was going to define the virtual reality. And then they hit that run button and big digital bang. And this, the simulation started to compute and the initial conditions began to change according to the rule set. And of course, that's a dynamic thing. So they kept changing. And the fact that we have a set of constants that if any changes were made in these constants, uh, even in the 10th or 12th or 15th decimal place, then the universe would have collapsed. It wouldn't be here. You know, it wouldn't be a, a stable, viable universe. It's only here because of these things balance just perfectly. And it's not just one number. It's a whole set. It's a set of numbers that all balance just perfectly. Matter of fact, Physicists have named that, I think, the anthropic principle. Mm -hmm. And they call it that because it looks like it was designed just for us. So that's why they call it anthropic principle. But it's a big mystery. It's one of those paradoxes. Well, the solution is simple. If the larger conscious system is creating a virtual reality so that consciousness will have uh, more meaningful experiences, then... It starts with this idea of I'll need an initial conditions and I'll need a rule set. And that then will evolve to be this virtual reality. So the, the virtual reality is evolved, not programmed. And we have uh, evolved virtual realities going on in computers and some of the better computer science departments and universities, you know, all over. They, they do these same things not as elaborate as the one we live in, but they still do it. You know, the idea works and, and works fine. So the virtual reality started to evolve. And I can see that this evolution is a trial and error sort of thing. So the fact that we have this anthropic principle that has this set of numbers so precisely defined, so our universe remains stable enough for us to have evolved here, well, that's explained. That's logical. Well, of course we do. That's how you make a virtual reality like this. And you'd want to make a virtual reality that was evolved, not programmed, because the programming would be just outrageous, too much, and it would be fixed. Yeah. You know, you'd make it up as you went, and it wouldn't be consistent, whereas if it evolves, it's all perfectly consistent with the rule set. Everything works together perfectly because it all evolved together. You mentioned um, stable systems. I always wondered why shouldn't it have stated nothingness? Wouldn't that doesn't that sound like the most stable system at all? It's stable, but it doesn't do anything or go anywhere yeah. or have any yeah. meaning or have any significance. So it certainly doesn't evolve. Yeah. No, it's the null set. Stable because once you have nothing but a null set, then that's what you have forevermore it's just a null set so there's no there's no value and it doesn't go anywhere so as a concept matter. yes mm -hmm. you can do that but it, it doesn't produce anything and actually we can make a very similar argument of determinism determinism isn't that far off from a null set it is a thing it's not null but it's all completely done already 
So nothing okay. changes, can be no consciousness, can be no choice, can be no learning, can be no evolution, because all those things require, you know, change, can be no change, it just is. So when you have that, that's it, you got it, nothing else. You see, it doesn't go anywhere. It's got absolutely no viability to do anything useful for anyone. It's not a viable kind of thing. It's like the null set. Yes, theoretically, null set's the simplest. And uh, maybe determinism might be simple too, but it's without value. Interestingly, um, this year's um, co-winner of the Nobel Prize, Sora Japan Rose, he apparently has joined the club, if I may say so, at the club of people who are uh, scientists who don't believe that the Big Bang was all there was that set of our universe, that there may have been an infinite number of Big Bangs preceding it and following it, a cyclical universe, as they call it, or a cyclical um, evolution of universes, to put it that way. What do you say to that? How, how, do you, how would you comment on, on that idea that there is a cyclical universe and uh, you know, infinite number of Big Bangs forever and ever so that yeah. evolution may go on and on? Well, I think what physicists do is they eventually, when they dig deeper and deeper into the nature of reality, they get to the point that they know they don't have the whole answer. They know there has to be something else. You know, that implicate order, that other thing has to be out there. Those hidden variables, that was an idea too. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, that there's, mm -hmm. there has to be something else going on to explain because the materialist viewpoint just doesn't provide any answers to things like where did that ball of plasma come from? You know, because there was no universe before that. So it didn't come from our universe. Then where did it come from? Mm -hmm. Space is expanding. What is it expanding to? How do you make new space? You see, they have all these paradoxes and things that they just can't answer. And they get to that point where they're against the wall and they just don't know. So they wave their hands in the air and they come up with something that, well, I think it's a cyclical thing, you know, and it comes and it goes and it goes on, you know, but try to pin them down to exactly how does that work? You know, what a, you know, what's the, what's the mechanism there and how that works? And they don't know. It's just an idea. So that I think is physics with its back against the wall can't come to any conclusions because its belief in materialism puts it in a space that doesn't have the answer. So they, they live in a, you know, we call it like an answer space. You know, here are all these answers, but the space they've created for themselves in this answer space with the assumption of materialism doesn't contain the answer. So they're stuck. And they make up things like that. And we have another thing like that, too, uh, back against the wall sort of thing. And that is in, uh, in order to explain these non-local events, these probabilistic events, you know, particles don't exist, they're just probability, and then they appear, they appear where the measurement's taken, that sort of thing. Uh, it seems like there's all these possibilities that exist, and then the measurement somehow creates which one of those possibilities actually gets manifested as a physical thing okay that's the way they that's the way they think so in order to keep that materialistic then we have this idea of many worlds oh every time something changes we have a whole new universe you it see spins now off I, just yeah spins off another universe yeah. so you know an electron flips from spin up to spin back or spin down a whole new universe needs to start. Oh, I scratch my head with this hand instead of that hand. Oh, we have a whole new universe needs to start. And you can see seven and a half billion people all doing zillions of things besides scratching their head. And every tiny thing has There's to an create <laughs> an entire universe. Yeah, now, yeah. in each one of those universes, everything that changes in that universe creates another universe. Cre so cre on. Spins off every action in that universe spins off, you know, it's got the same seven and a half billion people in it. And every time one of them spits, a whole new universe has to occur to where they spit and where they didn't spit. And the problem with it 
You know, I mean, that sounds ridiculous, right? Because everyone they spin off with all this interaction spins off that many more. So every one becomes a source, just like the original. Just now, a technical you, term, you're talking about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yeah, right. The yeah. many worlds. Yeah. Yeah. So it's because the back's against the wall. They don't know how to answer this. So they say, well, if you had all these universes that really... It's, it really is all materialistic. We're just jumping from one of these material universes to another. Mm -hmm. And in this one, the particle's here, and in that one, the particle's there, and the particle's actually in all those places, and we just skip around in the various universe. Yeah, well, that is, that is irrational, and it's not, uh, it's not practical. But I will give them, it's, yeah. it's possible you know, or I can put it, it's theoretically possible. In other words, it does do the job of keeping their quantum mechanics materialistic, but it does it at the price of being silly. Yeah. To fill it, in our, our audience, I think we, we need to mention superposition, which is one of the t main tenets of quantum mechanics, like everything, you call it a probability distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so far, they, they use the term superposition. Things uh, are in multiple states at the same time, and then the measurement creates a certain outcome, which was amongst that infinite number of possibilities would have been possible, but only it's it's the reason that the measurement is taking which manifests this particular outcome. Just just to right. fill in our audience, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but you know. yeah, yeah, that's okay. a basic tenet of uh, yeah. of quantum mechanics. Now, mm -hmm. of course, quantum mechanics has evolved to be a, a good science, and it's it's very accurate in its calculations. So it's good science, mm -hmm. but it's just as Feynman said, you know, shut up. You know, do the math, you know, you know calculate, shut up and calculate. Uh, calculate yeah, it's right. not, it's not a rational science. It's a, it's a mathematical, it's a calculation. So they know how to calculate if they start those calculations with the assumptions of, you know, particles or probability distributions. They're distributed. Yes. They're, they're everywhere, but nowhere. They're just possibilities. And if you start with that as your mathematics, that's what your wave function is. The wave function is a probability function. It's not a, a wave that's moving through some medium. It's just a probability function. So, yes, that's, that's the fundamental thing in quantum physics. And in quantum physics, you have these odd things that happen that defy um, materialistic logic. Like in the double slit, you know, experiment, the fact that when you look and make the measurement, it, cr it creates a particle there. Or in a double slit where there is a uh, delayed erasure, that is, you start the experiment, particle goes through one of the slits or the other, hmm. and you, you uh, measure which slit it goes through. Ah, now you've measured it, so you should just get a pile of particles behind each slit because you've measured it. Well, then the particle hits the slit, I mean, hits the screen, goes through the slits, hits the screen, and the experiment's over, but the information of which slit it went through is still there. And if you erase it, if you delete it, you erase it and say, all right, we don't have that information anymore. I knew which slit it went through, but I erased it before I looked at it. What happens? You get a you get a, a diffraction a, a diff, pattern. Yeah, you get a diff yeah. diffraction pattern or an interference pattern. We're you not see, talking so, about the experiment that you're setting up and that you're yeah. allowed to set up because yeah. of the weaknesses of the original double slit yeah. experiment, right? I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so that kind of a, a delayed uh, eraser experiment, which means you you erase the which way data. That's which you know which slit did it go through. You erase the which way data after the experiment basically is over. After the particle has already hit the screen and found a position on that screen, which can't change. But depending on what you do after the experiment's over, the experiment is different. That's a delayed ratio. So that just blows a big hole in a materialistic you know, account of that. That just doesn't work. But because of this, this uh, non-locality, things aren't local, things can be elsewhere. Um, it, uh, you have this many worlds theory that lets you jump from one of these many worlds to another. And that then supplies the magic of how things disappear and appear, you know, in, in probability. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it, it's, is not viable idea 
it just costs too much, you know, as far as, yeah. uh, you know, what pretty soon you have trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of universes, universes and that many, and that many again, every microsecond, you know, and each one of those creating that many again, every microsecond, which is a pointless process. I mean, there's no evolution there. If, if you just create no. as many outcomes as possible, it's, it's just equal to saying, well, let's not start it. Let's not play at all. That's you know? it. See, that's the point. It supports materialism because it supports yeah. determinism. See, everything's done. All the possibilities are done in these many worlds. You, the Which many was, worlds cover all possibilities. So now is, everything's determined. There's no change. The change is an illusion because we hop through these various pieces of these other reality frames. And that's what gives us the illusion of time and the illusion of choice and the illusion of consciousness is we're really hopping through all these frames. But you see, that is a circular argument. In order to hop through the frames, you need to hop. Well, you can't hop without time. Now I'm here, now I'm there. So you require time to make a hop to define time. That's not good logic. You see, it doesn't, it just doesn't work out well. So yeah, you know, determinism and materialism just have a lot of holes in them. And, you know, back in the early 1920s, you know, the, the Born and, and uh, you know, Heisenberg and Max Planck and Schrodinger and, you know, that whole crew, uh, they were so excited about the idea that we've busted materialism and we have a whole new world out there. You know, physics has just had this tremendous breakthrough about the nature of reality, so different than we thought. Wow. And... Yeah, you know, 20 years later, not so wow anymore because everybody just got sore heads banging their head against that door trying to come up with some explanation. And that's because those guys were really, really bright. These were really a bunch of smart guys that, that did this, but they didn't have the concept of virtual reality back in the 1920s. We didn't have the concept of a computer, much less one, you know, that could, uh, yeah. Well, I think at that time, we're not of any kind of a computer. I don't know, maybe, right. they had, maybe they had an abacus or something that you might call it a computer. But, you know, we didn't have a, a, a general purpose kind of computer. Digital computing was just not even a, a wild idea back at that time. And until you understand that this is a virtual reality, then you can't see the logic in that, you know, of why it's, of why it's that way. So those guys knew something big was up, but they had not the concept to understand it. And now we have the concept to understand it. But by now, people have gotten so used to the idea that, oh, yeah, materialism and determinism, that's the answer. Many worlds, well, that'll solve the problem, even if it is ridiculous as far as application goes. And uh, it's just weird science. So we're kind of stuck in this position of having given up and accepting uh, something that is not very logical at all in order to maintain our belief in materialism. So if I get you right and, and to let our audience catch up once more, um, you're addressing some of the weaknesses of the original double slit experiment. First of all, beginning with the fact that it started up with, with what's called feeble light, not even uh, single uh, um, uh, photons, like single dots of light, but, but feeble light. Do you want to comment on yeah. that? Well, feeble light is a way, you know, to do a, you know, if you put a light beam and do an experiment, you know, with, with a beam of light, that's called optics. When you do experiments with single photons, that's called quantum mechanics. You know, that's the difference. So the people have been sending beams of light through double slits, you know, for a long time. Young's experiments did that. And they, they found diffraction patterns and all that about shining, shining light through. So when they wanted to have a single particle to do this experiment, they didn't have a way to do it. It needed to be coherent. It needed to uh, uh, be just a single particle. They took a light source far, far away. And if you take a very dim, feeble light source and put it way over there, okay, now light goes out in a sphere right from that source of light. So let's say that's a little light bulb. So light goes out from that light bulb in a sphere. 
And as that sphere gets bigger and bigger, the number of photons on that surface gets smaller and smaller. You know, it all spreads out, right? So it's only a certain number of photons. You're spreading them out on a bigger area, so they get less dense. So all you have to do is put that light source far enough away such that the probability is that you'll get a single electron through the apparatus because the density of electrons by then is not a whole bunched up together. Oh, one's here and one's over there and one's down here. The electrons, okay. the Good. photons, I mean, the photons are all spread out. So that's the point of that, uh, okay. you know, so, so that's what they mean. The feeble light just means you take a light source that's dim to start with, you move it far away, mm -hmm. and you just do the calculation of the surface, the surface area, right? And the total number of photons to begin with, the surface area, you know, you divide by that, that gives you the density. So you move it far enough away that the probability is good for getting a single photon Something. now and then. So you'll get a photon now, you get a photon a little later, you know, maybe every tenth of a second, you might get a photon. And then you do your experiment and let the and let the results just build up over time until that arrangement gives you enough data that you see your interference pattern. You see? But, but the, out, the, out, the outcome, or I would say uh, the intention was still the same. They wanted to test, I guess, the nature of, of light. You know, is it is it a wave right. or is it a particle? And, and in order to do so, the intention still was to have single photons going through the slit, either one mm -hmm. of them. That's what's called double slit. Mm -hmm. Does it go through the left or right slit? And uh, we record it on the screen behind that double slit and see what what's mm -hmm. happening. Exactly. And, and so right, and and yeah. so the the outcome still was uh, somewhat um, confusing because at one point you had a wave pattern or diffraction yeah. pattern like like a, a consistent pattern behind those double mm -hmm. slits, and at other times you had the particle pattern, which means like single lines of of, of light. Right shot at the at the screen so the intention was it was well intended they didn't have all great technology like we do today we can replicate those um this this initial uh, experiment make it better to get better results more precise results as to the outcome is that correct so far do yeah yeah see that experiment was to resolve a paradox another paradox between the fact that if you send a lot of photons, okay, Einstein, I'll back up a little bit. Einstein was studying the photoelectric effect. And from that, he got the information from that study that light came in little chunks, discrete chunks of momenta. Well, that meant light was a particle because particles are defined as discrete chunks of momenta when they move. So he had that idea that light is a particle. And all the physicists looked at that and said, yeah, it looks like light is a particle. But when we shine a whole bunch of light on a double slit, we get a diffraction pattern. Now, if we just sent one photon at a time, it should just go through a slit and hit the screen behind the slit because that's what particles do. A particle travels in a straight line unless it's interacted by an outside force, right? Newton's second law, I think. So... We have this problem, particles go in straight lines without any force, and there's no force involved here, but yet lots of photons rearrange themselves in a pattern, an interference pattern. And a single photon doesn't have anything to interfere with. It can't interfere with itself, you see? So that was the big problem. One of these needs, has to be wrong, you know? How can it be? A particle, which photoelectric effect says it's a particle, and a wave because Young's experiment with the diffraction, you know, with the two slits or even a whole diffraction grating, and you get all these little dots, not just a, you know, the, the, the light just doesn't pile up behind the slits. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was why the experiment was done to resolve this conflict in theory. You had two theories, both well substantiated with experiments that pointed in opposite directions. So they threw these particles through, these photons, one at a time, and they found out they still got that interference pattern. And how does a single particle go through a hole and then distribute itself in an interference pattern on the screen? You see, that was the big mystery of quantum mechanics. Well, that's impossible 
according to Newton and according to materialism and according to particles and mass and how mass works. And it just violates the way we look at our reality where mass is fundamental. You see, mass isn't fundamental is what that says. <laughs> you know, that's wrong. Mass is not fundamental. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point of it. That's why those physicists were so excited about something, something brand new here. So that experiment was done. And since then, lots of double slit experiments have been done. And one of those seminal ones was done really in 1999 and then published in 2000. I think it's Scully Kim et al. Um, University of Maryland, I believe, was where Scully was from. But they came from different institutions and they came together to do this experiment. And this experiment was, was unique and very profound because people thought, well, you know, we get this strange result where single particles arrange themselves in an interference pattern. And that doesn't make any sense. It must have something to do with that measurement, you know, because we measure it has something to do with that measurement. We must be putting some kind of energy or some kind of thing. Now, this is another one of these back against the wall, putting the hands in the air and pulling out, you know, pulling out explanations that don't make any sense because you don't have anything better. I guess so, you wanted to say the Newtonian view of, of some force interacting yeah, with the particles. Right. So this force. In, so somehow. And the idea was, well, to make the measurement of the, what slit it goes through, you have to touch that particle with some energy of some sort. You know, you ah, got to okay. you got to touch it somehow. If you don't touch it anyhow, well, you, you don't have a measurement. So somehow you have to interact with that particle in order to get the measurement. And it's that interaction that causes this weird problem. Now, that doesn't make any sense, because if you ask, well, how does that interaction create this particle distributing itself in an interference pattern? And it's like, well, I have no idea, but it must be that because that's the only thing we're doing here that could save the materialism. So that was the idea that it was the interaction and you couldn't take the measurement of the which way data without interacting and therefore applying energy to the particle. And they were right. The measurement was the critical factor, but not the touching the particle with a piece of energy that has nothing to do with it. And this mm -hmm. experiment that they did in the 1999 and they published in 2000 That solved that problem because what they did is they had a particle go through the slit and immediately afterwards it hit what's called a BBO crystal. And when that particle hits that BBO crystal, it creates two entangled particles. Okay, two entangled particles. So one particle comes through, goes through one slit of the other, and it hits BBO crystal and creates an entangled pair. We need Now, to back up for our audience here. Entangled pair means two photons interacting as if they're connected, as they make one coherent system. No one exactly knows how, yeah. but that's an entangled pair. One changes its spin, for example, it immediately affects the other entangled particle. Right. Or if it changes its spin. Right. If yeah. it changes its polarization, it changes its momentum. So they did that. And what they did then is they put one of these particles, you have two particles, one's called the signal. One's called the idler. So one of the particles goes and hits the screen. The other particle goes down into a detector. And you have a detector here to catch the particles that go through slit one, and a detector over here to go through the particle, you know, that goes the particles that go through slit two. Mm -hmm. So now you're using that idler of the pair of particles to tell you what the which way data is. So you've figured out the which way data without ever touching the particle with any energy. Now, the measurement is indeed the, the thing, but that's because the measurement is creating information. It's all about information. That's it. The fact that that particle had to be touched with energy in order to be cr recorded as to what slit it went through, that was irrelevant. So okay. again, materialism got hammered again on that one because that was their one out because there was a material thing going on there that must have been responsible because because it just had to be, because that was the only thing that was somehow disturbing the problem. Yeah. But there's no reason why disturbing that particle with the measurement would cause it to <laughs> arrange itself <laughs> in an interference pattern. You know? So it didn't really make any sense, but you cling to, you, you cling to, to threads uh, when you're a believer. So this, this new experiment in 2000 just got rid of that problem because now we had a touchless way to find the which way data.
without ever touching the experiment. My theory supports Copenhagen. And uh, so my work really supports the original work that was done by Niels Bohr and the others. And I agree that it's the way they said it was. And current physics says, no, it's not that way. And I've asked them, well, if it's not that way, if you changed your mind away from, away from, from Bohr's analysis, where's the experiment that lets you do that? They can't show me one. They just decided that they liked the explanation better because it was less woo-woo and more materialistic. The physical world creates consciousness. Consciousness is a product of the physical world. And I reject that as, as uh, not true. And there's a lot of reasons why, but I start from the exact opposite. And that is that consciousness is the, one that's funda- is the thing that's fundamental and that the physical world is a derivative of consciousness and the hard problem, the problem of showing how consciousness is generated from a physical system. Now, how does the physical reality generate consciousness? The hard problem of consciousness. Mm-hmm. So you have physics tries hard to guess possible solutions, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I joke a little bit about the, you know, reach up in the air and grab, a, grab an answer. Mm-hmm. But in, in physics, we call that as a name, we call it hand waving. You know, you have hand-waving solutions, and what that basically means is you don't really have any facts to take you from A to B, but you can see that maybe there's some sort of uh, connection there could be, and it warrants more study, you see. And that's what I'm calling hand-waving, and that's reaching up in the air with your hand and, and pulling an answer out. So a lot of these things fall into that category where they make associations that Quantum physics, because it's non-local and weird, must account for all the other non-local and weird things that happen. Because consciousness is also non-local and weird. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of experiments. You can read Dean Radin's work, and you'll see there's hundreds and hundreds of experiments that show that consciousness can do some very non-local weird things as well. Therefore, consciousness must be a quantum thing because both of them are weird i think i got you on 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 where the main problems with uh the outcomes of quantum physics so far lie and where they are and where the inconsistencies are and where the original weaknesses in the experiment were and how you address that and how you come out um resolving all these these paradoxes uh by lending more evidence and, and, and creating more evidence in support of your theory of everything which says uh, consciousness is a primordial rule set of the game and, and matter is a secondary outcome and actually just a simulation of, of the rule set um, that we experience in our macroscopic world. Yeah, and one of, the, one of the other neat things, and this will maybe do a, a lead in into Bob's work, is that when you have this, this uh, understanding of reality being virtual, not only can you do better physics, But you also now have completely logical explanation of things like remote viewing. Um, you Let's know. talk about that. Remote yeah. viewing being the, the capability of some people, or not just some people. It was mm. actually a hard project of the CIA uh, here at some time, sure. for some time, where they uh, had these, um, let's call them psychic uh, mediums remote, yeah, or re, yeah, yeah, rem- remote, remote viewers, viewers that, that yeah. were able to uh, sure. obtain information without physically being in the place, without having any right. observational, observational uh, equipment to peek into whatever bunkers or whatever it were, mm-hmm. and, but, but they still um, obtained accurate information about someplace else in the world where they have never been right. only telepathically and, and by remote viewing capabilities. Please elaborate on that. Well, sure. So this, the same theory explains those things and the paranormal just becomes normal. You know, those kinds of things of remote viewing is just gathering data out of a database. And this database exists because it's required by the rendering engine that renders the virtual reality. Could we liken the database to what's sometimes called the Akashic Records in spiritual Eastern philosophy? Yes, you see those databases have, are, are available to consciousness because it's a consciousness is the computer. Consciousness is the player of the avatar. The body's the avatar. So if you're consciousness, this database that's made by the computer mm-hmm. needed for the, for the rendering then is available to you as consciousness because now you're in that realm. So 
You can remote view by getting database, uh, by getting uh, data out of the database. You can see auras by getting data out of the database. You send a query, a query against the database. Yeah. As the technical terms, you send a query out and you get information back. You get information back, yes. So ancient times, you know, people explored inner space. And fortunately, it's cheap to explore inner space. All you need is enough free time. And you can explore inner space and a will to do it. Uh, exploring outer space is a whole lot harder. It needs a lot of very, uh, you know, very difficult technology. But exploring inner space has always been available to people. So you'll find that, yes, these Akashic records and so on were known. They didn't know why they were there. They didn't realize it was a database necessary for the, for the rendering of the, of the virtual reality. They didn't have any of that understanding. But they did know that they could extract data from something somehow that was non-physical and that data would be correct and remote viewing is a you know if anybody still doubts that remote viewing is a real thing well do you know google it on the internet and you'll find a lot of sites where the people are very serious and they yeah. teach remote viewing and they do experiments and they can show you the experiments they do and they videotape them and it's a very legitimate thing. And yes, the CIA had a whole staff of remote viewers and they did some marvelous work. Several books have been written about that. And a movie made, uh, yeah. staring at goats. <laughs> yeah. Funny version of <laughs> Yeah, or the real funny version of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but anyhow, of course it works. And uh, understand, you know, you have people who are mediums and they, uh, you know, talk to dead people. Well, it's not really that the mediums are talking to dead people, but it seems like that. It, it, you know, it appears that way to them. But this model explains what's really going on. So yeah. that's like the, 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 the signature that somebody left in their lifetime, which is added to the database and they access that, the, 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 the psychics? No, most of the time when they have conversations with people who have passed on, they're really having a conversation with a larger consciousness system. Who is ah? Who, who really had on the rendering on the rendering that they did on that particular person? Yeah, because they have everything. They have all the details. You know, the, right, the consciousness right, right. made all the choices, and okay. and the rendering engine made all the physical motions. So they have all the information there, and and uh, that's you know that's available. So they're getting data out of a database, and they're getting information directly from the larger consciousness system. So that system will play that database you know this is the database that defines uncle fred who died 10 years ago so there's a database that describes him and it's a, a very very detailed database not just where he went and what he said but everything he felt you know all the consciousness data is in there too i would i would liken it to to records in the database yeah records in the database uncle that, fred's records right you know, describe from his lifetime. everything about him inside and out Consciousness and, and physical, and okay. that data then is available, and the larger conscious system confines itself to playing that data set and then interacting with the medium. Because all of these exchanges between mediums and clients isn't about Uncle Fred. It's always about resolution and helping the client, the person who's still here living. That's the reason for that. That's why the system does that. Uncle Fred's for, Uncle Fred's gone. There is no more Uncle Fred. Right. You know? But well, Uncle, there never was, according to you. Yeah, there, there never, never was, was an Uncle. It's yeah, just yeah. It's, it's just like there never was an elf in World of Warcraft. You know, there's no elves running around anywhere. Those are just mm -hmm. pictures on a screen. Well, we're 3D pictures in a virtual reality, mm -hmm. and that's the way our our body is. But so again, I would, I would have to say, why would the large consciousness to make that information available to to a medium if uh, one of the tenets of your theory holds that uh, the, the the agent should never be able to tell that it's a virtual reality. I well, mean, that again seems to break. Yeah, well, thing. the system plays it two ways. There's one, there's two things going on here. One, the virtual reality itself needs to be always consistent. But doing things with your mind, doing things with your with your consciousness, is outside of the system. It doesn't break the virtual reality, physical reality at all. It stays very consistent and tight. But you can use your, your consciousness to go outside the system. Now, see, this comes from the idea that, that, okay, in a virtual reality, 
the computer cannot be in the virtual reality. The computer that's computing the virtual reality can't be virtual inside the virtual reality. A virtual okay. reality yeah. can't compute gotcha. itself, so the computer has to be outside of that virtual reality. So the elf in World of Warcraft will never find in that virtual reality called you know, World of Warcraft, they'll never find the computer that's computing it there in a virtual space. Mm -hmm. It supports Google's claim of theory. Yes, exactly. That. You have to be outside. Mm -hmm. So, exactly. So the computer that computes our virtual reality has to be outside of our reality. Okay. Now the player, the player who plays the avatar also has to be outside the virtual reality. Same idea. The player makes all the choices. Mm -hmm. Okay. For that avatar. But the player is the person sitting there behind the computer with the mouse and the joystick making all the choices for okay. the avatar. Gotcha. See? Mm -hmm. So, and that player isn't inside the virtual reality. It has to be outside the virtual reality. So, so we, you and I are avatars talking to each other at the moment. We are avatars, but, but the, the mind that is making up the conversation and processing it is consciousness. You see? So we're, we're still two players in the larger consciousness system exactly so avatars interacting talking here right via zoom okay. so you're an elf and i'm a barbarian in this world of warcraft multiplayer game and we're having a conversation about how we're going to go beat the the boss and you know in the cave and we're having a conversation about how to do that right okay. and there's actually two players somewhere not necessarily anywhere close you know one may be in china and one may be in new york And each one, one's playing the barbarian and one's playing the elf and they're having a conversation back and forth about something they're going to do. And so the players are non-physical to the virtual reality, you know, to the, to the avatars. The computer is non-physical from the avatar's point of view. So, and that has to be that way because the player and the computer have to be in the same reality frame because they're interacting with each other all the time. Gotcha. You don't interact with things in different reality frames. You interact with things in one reality frame. Mm -hmm. So player and the, and the computer are non-physical and they're interacting with each other. The actual virtual reality is just a computation. There are no elves. There really are no elves or barbarians, either one, running around anywhere. They're just computations. And that's the way it is with us. So the virtual reality only exists in the minds of the players. That's an important part. So you see, if World of Warcraft didn't have any players, what would its server be doing? Nothing. Because all that server does is send data streams to players. If there's no players, no data streams, there's no direction, no reality. Nothing. So a player comes in and out goes a data stream. 10,000 players are playing. There's 10,000 data streams going out. Right. Right. And the right. system takes all the interactions and this guy does this and this guy does that. And how does it interact? The computer computes all that stuff and then makes a pretty picture on the screen so that the player can see what's going on. You know, it's a visual can aid that can play it. All right, so that's our bodies are like that pretty picture on the screen, except we're not on a 2D screen. We're here in a 3D space, mm -hmm. and it's the same sort of thing. So what does that tell us? That tells us that this, this source, this larger conscious system, and the server, it's a piece of that source, and the player, all are non-physical to us, but they also are more fundamental than us. You know, that's how we break this down. So that's how the virtual reality works it, and the individual units of, of consciousness would be sort of a holographic replica of the large consciousness system would you go i wouldn't call on? it holographic that's probably not that's a 3d viewpoint you know you're you're yeah. locked into into a 3d uh spatial reality there no there's no space in consciousness okay. space consciousness doesn't have space um, so it's, it's a self-sufficient term individuated units of consciousness yeah. so it's yeah. just a subset it's a piece You know, and, and sometimes if, if you really were a person who did uh, a computer, you know, if you were a computer uh, science guy, then I would tell you that it's a, uh, you know, the, the, the individual unit of consciousness is like a virtual, a virtual machine, you know, a virtual person mm -hmm. that's, gotcha. that yeah. is a subset of a larger computer. 
So the big computer has all kinds of little virtual computers running around that it's doing their own individual things in, but they're all part of this big computer. They're just subsets of it, pieces of it. So we're all, we are all one. We're all part of that larger conscious system, but we're also separate. You know, all, all those uh, subsets are just pieces of the bigger thing, but they're, but they are in some ways, they're not fully independent, but they are, they have, they're independent actors. They can do things. They have independent yes. agency. Our 3D world in which we live currently is but one of many virtual realities. Yes. You correctly. Yes. Okay. And, there, and there's all sorts of virtual realities. There are virtual realities. I, I describe them as having a tight rule set. And that's like this physical universe. In other words, our physics and chemistry and biology, those rules are so precise that every single energy exchange is defined, you know, that we call that physical causality. So everything is interactive. If I do something, it affects you, you know, cause and effect. Yeah, yeah there's, there's just the effects just ripple out, you know, so if I make a choice, like I'm going to marry Sally instead of marrying Sue, then the fact that I make that choice makes a difference. It makes a difference to me. It makes a difference to Sally. It makes a difference to Sue. It makes a difference to Sally and Sue's parents. It makes a difference to their other boyfriends that, you know, it ripples out. So you make choices and those choices just flow out and, and interact with other people. So it's a very interactive game. The computer, of course, computes those interactions and the players all make choices in those interactions And the computer, computer basically just gives you eye candy that you look at so you can get a better idea of what it, what it really looks like. So the virtual reality only exists in the minds of the players. No players, no data streams. A player gets a data stream and it interprets that data stream into the reality. So you look at a megapixel worth of light dots on a monitor And you turn that million light dots of light into rivers and streams and rocks and elves and barbarians and, mm. you know, swords and all sorts of things. You just take all those light dots and you do an interpretation of what those things are. And you do that based on your experience. You know, you have to have experience. You have to have seen a sword before to say, oh, that's a sword. It needs to be part of your experience base to do that. Well, we do the same thing. So we're getting a data stream. We interpret it in terms of our own history, our own our own uh, experience, experience base, and yeah. And, yeah, which which is also our beliefs, our fears, our ego, yeah. our everything. We interpret it that way. So you see, everybody now lives in their own personal reality because everybody's interpretation is a little different because their experience base is a little different. So all of us live in different reality frames. When you say, how could those people be so stupid? Well, those people don't see the same reality that you do. Yeah. It's not that they're stupid. They just see a different reality because they've, just, been, they've been fed data that, that defines that other reality frame. So yeah. they're looking at us and saying the same thing. How could they be so stupid? Because they figure that we share their reality, but we don't. Yeah, so everybody lives in their in their own reality. And the way it works is that it takes, a, you know, information is non-physical. So consciousness is non-physical. Consciousness is an in, is a information system. Books are physical. Ink is physical. And that, that produces data. Data can be physical. So what happens is that information isn't the ink and it isn't the paper it's the content it's the it's the um, significance it's the meaning that it finds in all those squiggles of ink on that paper a consciousness looks at it and those squiggles have meaning okay so the first the first interpretation is you take the, the symbols the data A consciousness looks at the symbols, data, and turns it into meaning or significance. And that is not a that is not a hundred percent function. That depends a lot on the individual, how they do that. It depends on the language, how precise the language can be, how precise is the writing, or the squiggles on the paper. So there's a there's a lot of imprecision and uncertainty there. 
and it has to do with the individual. Now, that, that consciousness who gets that meaning and content, it would like to share that with somebody else. So it takes that, con that information and it codes it into data and it sends it to that somebody else. Now, it may be a sound wave coming out of my mouth or it may be a, you know, a clickety click for an old uh, teletype machine or it could be anything, but that's data. It could be an email. You know, and it's it's now it's digital marks on digital paper, you know, and whatever it is, and it sends it to somebody in a form of data. Now, the person that gets that, the person it's sent to, the receiver, they see the data, they look at it, and they interpret that data based on their own experience base, yeah. which is not necessarily what was meant the by the person who encoded it from his personal Base, which, you which see? Is a beautiful explanation for why communication is so hard. To that's exactly why communication is so hard. And that's exactly why we all live in, in our own reality, you know, in our own separate reality. Communications is very difficult. So information is the content, the meaning. Remember, we said that in that information system, you had all random bits, no information. But then if you had organization of some symbols or some things that meant something, the information is the meaning that meant something. So then we have dictionaries that give us meaning for all kinds of symbols. If we string symbols together the right way, they have certain meaning. You know, we call those, those things strings of symbols words. Yeah. And we, we look at those and that's the meaning. But the, yeah. it takes a consciousness to get the meaning, to get the content. Mm. You see, that ha that's, a, that's a thing of consciousness. That's non-physical. You know, how, mu how, how much space does meaning take? You know, how much sense does does significance take? Well, it doesn't take up any space, doesn't have any weight, you know, it's non, it's non physical. So that's the difference between data and information. Consciousness creates information. So now you've got a larger consciousness system who has a subset of its part that's acting as a server, a computer serving us a data stream. We take in that data stream, we bias it with our own biases and with our, our data stream, we come up with some kind of an idea. And that, that interpretation we make of it is what we see as reality. You're also referring to, if I get you right, uh, what's called qualia sometimes, you know, yeah. the, the, the uh, mysterious quality of qualia. Why does something feel like, or why does a rose smell like, and you know, all it's these me. internal sensations that we perceive as yeah. human beings, which we, don't really have a good explanation for you seem to allude to that no, yes these are these are our interpretations of data and people can interpret it quite differently mm -hmm. so we can't specify it physically because it isn't physical that's why people say well what are these call you and you just mm -hmm. can't get a handle on them that's because they're non-physical they're not physical things they're interpretations of the data by an individual Now, this takes us back to the double slit, because why is it that in a double slit experiment, the observer makes such a big difference? See, the observer who, who now has observed, it went through the slit, collapses that wave function to just piles of particles behind each slit. Why is that? That's because until a player gets the data, It's not in this reality. It only becomes a part of this virtual reality as it gets to the mind of a player. Because that is the idea of the simulation. Yeah. It only renders content whenever a player needs to have that Con content. Exactly. So because of that, that's what makes the double slit experiment work the way it works. So that, you know, for them to, for the, to look at it and say, oh, I know it went through here. Now there's information coming to a player. And when you get that information, then there's a, there's a result. When you have that information, you have to get a piles of particles behind each, each slit. And you don't have that information, then it's not in that reality yet until it hits the screen. It's still I just probability I, until it hits the uh -huh. screen. And when it hits the screen, it's a random draw from that probability distribution. I get that part, but strictly speaking, following your um, logic so far, if I followed you correctly, correct me if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, um, there should be different outcomes for different observers and not the same. I mean, so far in quantum mechanics, 
several observers had similar outcomes as long as the experiment design was sure. similar. But according to what you're saying, the outcome should never be predictable depending on who is doing the experiment. No. And who's what, and more importantly, who's watching yeah. what's been recorded. Yeah. No, it's only, it's only when you get into details that are personal that you're going to get a personal result. But if you're just a detail of is something there or not, you know, is there a microphone in front of you? Well, me and everybody else you see in this video, we don't have to say, well, okay, it's my opinion that, yeah, I think there might be, or I don't think that thing's a microphone. It looks like maybe a, a can with a, uh, you know, with a, with a little black pom-pom on top. That's not a microphone. So Which every, sense, uh, yeah, everybody looks at that and says it's there because that's not personal. But if, if you said, is that a good microphone? Is that a good quality microphone? Now you'd have all sorts of different opinions about whether or not that was a good quality microphone or not. So there's a subset of information overlapping, which we, um, you know, have a consensus on as to our shared reality, which applies yes. to everyone. Like people walk, you know, on two feet and have two arms and right. yada, yada, you know, all these, these things that make up our, our human existence. We, we have a consensus on that because that is the shared subset the shared of information subset. to the players. I mean, it's a part of the right. rule set that is, that is common for all these avatars right. of, of similar or make right. if i'm if i may say yes, that way exactly so so that is a shared reality and there is personal uh, reality deviating or splitting off from that which is deeply personal and can only be personal because yeah. it's only relevant to that avatar slash player inside the virtual yeah. reality system yeah. so it's all a matter of uncertainty so those things that we interact with that have very small natural uncertainty associated with them they seem to be objective like that mic in front of you or, or the, you know, the wall behind you. you see, or materialism those, for so long. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's, they seem to be objective because they have very small uncertainty. Now they have a little bit of uncertainty, but it's real, real tiny. So the things that have a lot of uncertainty, like how good a mic is that? You see, well, it depends on how much you know about mics. And if you're familiar with that brand that's written there on the, the side that I can see and, you know, and how many models of that. So there's a lot of variables there and there's uncertainty about those. And because of that, people will have a lot of different opinions, but because there's very little uncertainty as whether or not there's something that looks like a mic in front of you, there's very little uncertainty about that. So then everybody agrees on that. So we agree on things and we see things as being objective if, they're, if their associated uncertainty is small. Actually, everything is subjective, which is what you're saying. You know, it's what you know, everything is subjective, but there's a whole set of things that are approximately objective because their uncertainty is small. The things that have large uncertainty are subjective, what we call mm -hmm. subjective, but everything's actually subjective. So apparently we want to hang on to the concept that, um, if, if our experience here is meaningful, if our personal consciousness or our individuals, we as individuated units of consciousness are supposed to be significant, then uh, we like to think as, you know, we, we cling to this idea that something of us should last, you know, indefinitely, ideally. What, what do you make of that yeah. well, within your theory? You are an individuated unit of consciousness. You're not your avatar. So your avatar, just like your elf, dies. And that doesn't mean that you, the consciousness, doesn't die because your elf dies. You know, the, the, the boy playing that elf doesn't fall over, you know, on his desk, uh, you know, with his, with his face, you know, in the, on the mouse because his elf died. They're two different things. So we are the consciousness. We're the player. And when our body dies, we consciousness go on. We're immortal. We just keep going on. And what do we, we do lose next? One up, we lose one avatar, we might get another. We get else. another. We okay. get another one. And the point is, we're here to make choices to grow up, to reduce the entropy of our consciousness, to evolve the quality of our consciousness. And we can't do that very quickly because it, it requires changing ourselves, who we are, growing up uh, and becoming love you know that caring that kindness uh you know that that about other that we need to 
that we need to uh, emulate, which is the reason that we're here in this virtual reality entropy reduction trainer. That's the point. That's why we're here. And we have to try it again and try it again and try it again because this growth is a very slow process. Which supports the idea of reincarnation. We might get yeah. another shot as a human being. Right. Uh, and, and so we're helping the larger consciousness system playing the game of evolution so long as it wants right. to. What happens when entropy is zero? It lowered all the entropy there was. What happens then? Never gets there. It it's just like it's just like you can in the physical world you can never get to absolute zero you know, just because the act of trying to cool it heats it you can't ever actually get there and that's the same with entropy you cannot get to a, a zero entropy and entropy to be lowered always requires the input of work you have to do things you just don't sit around and your entropy drifts lower if you just sit around your entropy drifts higher entropy increases. That's the second law of thermodynamics. If you don't put some sort of energy in, then your entropy is going to get greater, not smaller. So you're trying to lower your entropy. It takes work. So even if you could get to zero, which you can't, if you got there and said, ah, I'm at zero. Okay, I'm done. As soon as you say I'm done, your entropy starts going up because you're no longer putting energy into keeping it low. So that's a reason why you are never done and you never get to zero because it always takes effort to lower entropy. Consciousness, of course, is information system. It's trying to evolve, which means it's trying to lower its entropy. So it's looking for ways to do that. It needs, you know, it has a certain number of possibilities of new states it could move into. It could maybe make more intricate patterns of patterns of sequences of patterns and say, oh, that lowers entropy some because I'll give those special meaning. But eventually it, it starts to uh, level out, it goes asymptotic. The, the growth, the lowering of entropy kind of runs out of options. You know, you've kind of made as many patterns of patterns of patterns and patterns that make you any sense. And yeah, 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 you kind of hit that wall and you're getting diminishing returns for the effort put in, right? Mm -hmm. So what you need then is something new, a new idea a new dimension in which you can move. And that new dimension that opens up more possibilities, well, it's the same dimension that, uh, that uh, single-celled things took here in our biology, right? You had a single-celled thing and it evolved into a multi-celled thing, which evolved into uh, a thing with uh, um, specialization of those multi-cells, you know, livers and kidneys and hearts and lungs and all that stuff. And it, it gets get more and more complex, but once you're, once you have that, those other possibilities, what you can produce, what you can evolve into, grows immensely. So if you want a lot of growing room, you create another bunch of IUOCs and give them free will and let them interact however they will, and you don't control how they interact. They're going to learn from their experience. They're going to have their own experience base by which they interpret things. And you're going to interact with them. And now the possibilities, what can all of you build together? What can you all do together? What sort of organism can you all get together and create, you see? Well, now you've got a huge amount of evolutionary space just opened up in front of you. So it's not that the system was bored and it just wanted to uh, get out and experience something. And that's more that that hand waving, you, you know, you don't know what else to say, your back's against the wall, so you make something up. But there was a reason for that. A monolithic system has a limited evolutionary potential. And a system that's broken into pieces and let those pieces interact with each other in creative ways has a huge potential, particularly if there's seven and a half billion of those pieces that are all interacting with each other. You know, Just at this time, I mean, over yeah, the course right. of our planet was like a hundred billion or more. Right. So, yeah. but you know, the, the more there are, the more possibilities there are of what it is you could do with that. It's like parallel processing. Right. Just, so, so there's obviously a lot more you can do with that, you see. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the idea why you get that sort of thing. Now, you have this larger consciousness system, and it's uh, got all these IUOCs, individual units of consciousness, and it has to learn how to interact with them. And right off, the 
the uh, consciousness system says, all right, IUSCs, let's line up. We're going to be kind to each other now because that's low entropy. We're all going to, uh, you know, work together. And, and those IUOCs say, no way. I'm going fishing. You know, I'm not going to line up and act nice or anything like that. I don't feel like it. So the system had to learn how to optimize with all the IUOCs. So in that case, we were its teachers in that it had to interact with us and help us become more profitable to it by having us grow up by making good decisions. But and it couldn't cooperate. And, and yeah, cooperate. But, but it couldn't tell us what to do or how to do it because that's got it. Free will. That got in the way. We have free will. If you tell somebody, then it's not actually their choice. And if it's not their choice, they don't grow up any. So interacting with us, it learned that love, approaching people with caring, with compassion, with cooperation, optimizes a social system. And it had created a social system when it created IUOCs. And it took it some time before it learned that any way it tried to push, cajole, threaten, or anything else, it always turned out badly. It was always suboptimal. And it only got optimal when you let them make their own choices in their own way, but gave them maybe some guidance or some encouragement, but didn't tell them what to do, didn't, didn't usurp their free will. So here they are, and they're all in this big chat room, chatting away with each other, and they grow up some because they're interacting, they're forming clubs and cliques and things, and they're, they're, they're creating stuff, but it's slow, you see? So now the system says, well, what we need is a, rea is a, is a rule set that creates a game that has real consequences to the choices. So it says, well, how do I do that? I make a virtual reality. I evolve a virtual reality. Now my IUCs can log on to these characters, and these characters have this tight rule set. It's not just chit-chat in, in a big chat room. This is life and death, you know, staying Saying, uh, you know, warm in the winter, staying fed, uh, having families and children. And it was it uh, was a totally different, different world. And we were on our own to do it however we could do it. And we went from not having grown up very much, but had a lot of potential. And free will means you have a lot of potential to lower your entropy and a lot of potential to raise your entropy. Grace. You can make good choices or bad choices. So we had all this potential, but just a little bit of experience somewhere in the middle. And suddenly we got dropped in this place where, you know, life and death decisions every day, if not every hour of every day. And what we did was start like everybody starts. The potential we actualized first was the fear. Oh, no. The competitive, oh, you've, you've got something to eat and I'm hungry, so I'm bigger than you are. Now I got something to eat and you're hungry, you know, that kind of thing. So we, we uh, acted that way, which is not good choices. That's where we start. And, you know, we have this, this history and it comes from all different cultures, indigenous tribes, you know, everywhere of the jealous and angry gods that are constantly, you know, they get angry and they crush the people, you know, they cause great, you know, hordes of locusts and other kinds of things to come and storms. And it's always this, this kind of love hate kind relationship with the God because the God's all powerful and the God really has certain requirements. You need to do this. You need to do that. And if you don't do the things right, then the God's going to punish you. And it has all that. Well, I think that is comes from our collective consciousness back in a time when the larger conscious system was just learning that love and cooperation and caring is the optimal way forward. It started out trying to bully us, trying to tell us what to do. You know, like I said, line up everybody. We're going to practice being kind and considerate today. <laughs> that doesn't work because it's not about actions. It's not about how you act. It's about how you are. So you can act as kind and cooperative as you like, but that won't help you grow up. You have to be kind. That's different. And that's why it's so slow to evolve, because it's a matter of changing you at the being level. 
if we all could just read the playbook and say, oh, I know, I just have to act this way and that way and that way, and we'll all just evolve and it'll be great. You can't evolve. It's not an intellectual process. It's a being process. So that's why you can't do it in a lifetime, because to do it, you change who you are. You have to be kind. So you're saving, are you saying that you're saving um, reincarnation for us as well? Free will we already saved. Reincarnation yeah. is saved, apparently. Do you think that our individuated uh, unit of consciousness may indeed persist potentially indefinitely? Eternally? Sure, absolutely. Immortal. Absolutely immortal. There's no reason... There's no reason for the larger system to delete it as long you know, as it has the potential to evolve, then it's in the game, even if it's de-evolving, if it has the potential to evolve. I suspect it's possible that something could get to the point that was so de-evolved that it no longer had any potential to evolve, in which case it would probably be deleted. But that's really hard to imagine. We don't see things like that, just ugly people that we know. <laughs> they still have a lot of potential you know, to evolve. They just need to figure a few things out and grow up a bit. So. Just need time and, and, and opportunities yeah. to grow. You know, stuff happens, and you have to take everything as an opportunity to learn. You know, things happen, and when they do, they create different circumstances. And it's not so much what those circumstances are. What happens isn't all that important. What's important is how do you deal with with what happens. What make what you choices? Do you make of it? Yeah, what choices do you make because of that what happens? That's what's important. Another thing that I, I often say is that you get what you need and what you deserve. So however this turns out, it's going to be, you know, that's what we need. You know, in other words, need to grow up and what you deserve, what you've earned by the amount of growth you've already done or the lack thereof. Mm. You know, so There it is. So let's hope that a lot of people will watch this interview and take you up on the offer, uh, you know, for growth and evolution, personal mm. evolution and super nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome.